talking about traditional literary criticism. Let's look at the definition of traditional literary criticism and the green sheet, please. It's the shortest definition. It's in the back of page two, Suzanne. Traditional right here. Mm-hmm. Academic literary criticism prior to the rise of new criticism, that's what we'll talk about next. Uh, in the United States, tended to practice traditional literary history, tracking influence, establishing the canon of major writers in literary periods, and clarifying historical context and allusions within the text. Okay, historical context clarification and allusions within the text. So my example for Goldilocks, which is totally fictional, by the way, I completely made all of this up. As it turns out, Goldilocks is not even a Grimm Brothers fairy tale. But if this were true, this would be great as a uh, thesis statement for a literary criticism paper in the traditional bent for Goldilocks. The Brothers Grimm intended Goldilocks to be a cautionary tale for children after their young cousin, Wilhelmina Bettelheim, was mauled to death by bears in a forest outside of Steinau, Germany in 1814. Countless European children's lives were saved. Well, that's totally made up, but that would be really good traditional literary criticism if it were true, but it's not. However, I have given you two, two, two examples as we've been reading the Canterbury Tales and talking about medieval history of actual historical events that have affected the literature that we've read. Um, no. Although we do see uh, the Black Plague as a historical <coughs> event of, as laying the groundwork for which story that we read? The Pardoner's Tale, right, begins with death stalking the land. So if you wanted to make some kind of conclusion about how the plague affects the outcome of that story, then you could research the plague and come up with a theory and prove that, and that would be good traditional criticism of Pardoner's Tale. However, back when I introduced the medieval period to you and gave you some history of the period. I told you about a specific event that inspired, probably inspired, a Grand Brothers fairy tale. You remember what it was? Yes, the Children's Crusade, or the Children's Crusades, actually, and they probably inspired which story? The Pied Piper. The Pied Piper, right. So you could definitely write a paper about that if I was allowing you to write about fairy tales, which I'm not. You're writing about the fairy tales, sorry. Um, but specifically, an historical occurrence that affected a story or that might explain a hole in a story. What else did I talk about? Chaucer being accused of rape. That's correct. Chaucer being accused of raptus that may have affected the story that he wrote, The Wife of Bath Tale. You could research those charges and then you could go through and try to make a strong case about why you think those charges made that story the way that it was. That would be effective traditional <laughs> literary criticism. Okay, let's move on to the next one then. If you don't want to write traditional literary criticism, you can write new criticism. This one is probably the most difficult um, for high school students anyway. Look at the definition of new critical literary criticism on your green sheet. Okay, the new criticism is a type of formalist literary criticism that reached its height during the 1940s and 1950s that received its name from John Crow Ransom's 1941 book, The New Criticism. New critics treat a work of literature as if it were a self-contained, self-referential object. Rather than basing their interpretations of a text on the reader's response, the author's stated intentions are parallel between the text and historical context, such as author's life. New critics perform a close reading, concentrating on the relationships within the text that give it its own distinctive character or form. New critics emphasize that the structure of a work should not be divorced from meaning, viewing the two as constituting a quasi-organic unity. Special attention is paid to repetition, particularly of images or symbols, but also of sound effects and rhythms in poetry. New critics especially appreciate the use of literary devices such as irony to achieve a balance or reconciliation between dissimilar or even conflicting elements in a text. You can go on and read from there. But basically, if you are writing a new critical piece, you're not going to have any outside research. It doesn't matter 
what happened in his in the historical context of the story. It doesn't matter what other people think about it. All that matters to a new critic is what is on the page. It doesn't matter what the author intended. It doesn't matter what the author's experiences were. None of it. All that matters is what you get off the page as you read it. And they like to analyze, especially the language used, things that appear over and over again, what particular symbols are there. And my example for Goldilocks is the repetitive use of two plus the repeated structural trope of three items, two of which are unsuitable, indicates that Goldilocks wishes to break free from the constrictive family marriage pattern of two adults plus children. Did you follow that at all? No. Okay. How do we see the word T-O-O? -O? Two. Come up again to get into the story. Uh, word poor just going. Yeah. Oh. yeah. The baby bear adds, you know, mine's two, or you know, mine is two, or the the mama bear says that. So you yeah. hear they hear the word two, two, two over and over again. Two, 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 two. It looks like T-O-O, -O, but it also means T-W-O. And here we have Goldilocks, you know, trying to wreck a family structure of the mama bear, the papa bear, and the baby bear. Goldilocks wants to break free from that marriage pattern of two adults plus children. Goldilocks is a loner. She's saying women don't have to have the family unit to get by, right? Couldn't there be a feminist yeah. like you too? Sure, it's kind of a, that, that particular statement that I just made is a melding of new criticism and feminism together, yes. But, um, and of course this is just an example, once again this is not a real paper I would write, but this is a way that I'm looking at repetition of text, hearing the word two, two, two over and over again and trying to figure out what that must mean. All right, it does not matter what the historical context of the story is. It does not matter what anybody else has said about it. It doesn't matter what the author meant when they wrote it. It's what I get from it and what it inspires in me as I read it. And hearing the word two, 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 two is telling me all through that two is not acceptable to Goldilocks and that she is trying to break up the family unit by invading their home and breaking their chairs and eating their food and sleeping in their beds. Because for her, the family unit is not sufficient for happiness. Yes, Alex? No, I'm talking about that. Oh, okay. Yes, Suzanne? So you could take that and you could stretch on it and say, like, maybe because of her family, like, that's too much for a paper, right? Do you get what I'm asking? Like, if you talked about this and then explained, like, why she hated the marriage structure because maybe, like, her parents' marriage wasn't good, like... Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good point, but there's not going to be much textual yeah, support for that in this little simple story. Mm -hmm. But if you were doing this about a more complex story with more detail, then yes, that would be definitely a good way to go. Could you make the opposite argument that she like wants to be part of the race? Like, uh... Sure, you can make that argument too. Yes, two. Here I just said two. I said two again. <laughs> but yes, you could definitely make that argument. I think so, maybe. All right. If new criticism does not appeal to you, if this does not sound like something you want to do, well, there's still yet another option. Moralist criticism. Now, moralist criticism is not the same thing as finding the moral at the end of the story. Yeah. Like that, no, that's not what moralist criticism is. Okay, you're doing it wrong if your thesis statement is just a restatement of the moral of the story is don't break into people's houses. That's not nearly complex enough. You're not going to have any significance for that argument. Look at the definition of what moralist, def of moralist criticism is here. Aristotle and Plato are responsible for these ideas. And um, they both have different, different ways of getting at it. But um, the dialogue, look at the second sentence <coughs> under Plato, the dialogue between Socrates and two of his associates shows the participants of this discussion including that art must play 
a limited and very strict role in the perfect Greek Republic. Richter provides a nice summary of this point. Poets may stay as servants of the state if they teach piety and virtue, but the pleasures of art are condemned as inherently corrupting to citizens. Um, one reason Plato included these ideas in his Socratic dialogue because he believed that art was a mediocre re re reproduction of nature. I'm fast forwarding to the end of that, that paragraph. So in short, if art does not teach morality and ethics and it is damaging to its audience, and for Plato, this damaged his republic. So Plato argues that in order for art to be good, then it has to teach some level of morality or ethics to its people, to its audience. And you can make a judgment as a moral critic whether or not the, your, the story succeeds or does not succeed in that effort. But once again, if all you're doing is pointing out the moral of the story is, don't eat parts that doesn't belong to you, then that's not nearly complex enough to justify an academic paper. Here's an example of a moralist thesis statement that would be uh, justifiable. The failure of the bears to prosecute Goldilocks indicates that the bears were more interested in social justice for the poor than the enforcement of criminal law. Zane, you're looking pensive thinking about it. Okay, well, this is not the moral of the story, it's a cute little pat answer. This is saying what this story is really arguing to you. Social justice for who? The poor. Yeah, who? Goldilocks being the poor. You have to assume that Goldilocks is an orphan here, and the bears don't maul her. That's certainly well within their capabilities. They're bears. They're super fast, they're super strong. She's just a little blonde girl. They could eat her very easily. They don't. They just kind of scare her out of the house. They don't call the police, they don't kill her. You know, it, it's as if the bears understand her plight and they show her some mercy. Pardon? Would the police be bears? Do you mean? Maybe they're wolves? I don't know, I'm not sure. Check Zootopia. But um, at any rate, this is a far more sophisticated argument than just the moral of the story is. This is digging deep to show what this story is encouraging its readers to do, and that is to show mercy to those who wrong you, to those who have less than you, to share what you have, and not to act out in vengeance when you are wronged. That's, that's far more complex. Does this make sense to you? Okay, if you want to do moralist criticism, I urge you to please run your thesis statement by me before you write your paper. Because it's, it's sometimes too easy with moralist criticism to do something that's too cute and pat and easy. And moralist criticism needs to be complex in order to be legitimate. Okay, so um, the problem with moralist criticism is that sometimes it's very difficult to get significance with moralist criticism. It's difficult to get significance with a lot of different types of criticism. Any kind of theory that you propose in any kind of paper, uh, science or math or history or language, everything is gonna need to be a significant point because otherwise you're wasting your time. Um, Here's a little story of what happened to me. Michael. Okay. Uh, when I was in college, I took a drama as literature course, and it was a wonderful course, and I really respected my professor, Dr. T. And uh, we were T. supposed to, pardon? I just remembered Mr. T from. Not, not T, T, T E A G U E. But anyway, um, Dr. T was a wonderful professor, and I really wanted to impress her and do well in her class because I liked her so much. And it was, you know, paper writing time as it often is in college. And we were supposed to investigate a modern playwright and then just go write a paper. In college, they don't often give you actual topics to write about. They just tell you, to, you know, write a paper vaguely and then you have to figure it out on your own. And if it's not a good topic, oh well. So I decided that I was going to investigate Wendy Wasserstein who had written a play called The Heidi Chronicles at the time that was really hot on Broadway. 
and I started to do research trying to figure out what I was going to write about Wendy Wasserstein and or Stein and the Heidi Chronicles and so I read a bunch of interviews with her and I read all her other plays of which there were like four maybe and um, you know I read everything and, and I thought wow you know in all these interviews that she gives it seems like all these plays are reflecting actual experiences that she had. Like here's this joint interview with her sister and they're talking about this experience they had on vacation and this is exactly the thing that happened in this scene in this play. And so I was like, wow, her actual life is in all of these plays. And so I wrote this like 10 page paper, you know, and I'm staying up the night before and it's 4 a.m. and I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm, writing and I'm breaking it down. And I'm like, this scene is when this happened to her in college. And this scene is like when her dad lost his job then. And then this scene is like when she got a divorce. And da -da 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 -da. I'm breaking it all down and I've got my 10 pages. And then I get to the conclusion and I'm like, oh. Um, exactly. What's the point? Oh, okay. So authors' real lives affect their work. Of course it does. Durr. Like it had never occurred to me the entire time that I was writing that that didn't matter at all, that I was not making any kind of point, that I didn't have an opinion. I didn't, I mean, my whole thesis was her work reflects her life. That's true of nearly every artist of every variety. And it was, you know, the paper was due. I was done. I had no more time. And I just had to be, my conclusion was just like, bleh, bleh, bleh. And then I had to turn it in, you know, like this with my head down, knowing what I had just given her was no good. And as it turned out, I got a B on the paper, which, I, mean, I do not get Bs on papers. Okay. But I knew I, I, it was justified. But all she wrote was, B and then so question mark at the end of my paper and I was like yeah that pretty much something yeah that's thank you for the B <laughs> thank you very much and so that th I then asked myself that question after every paper that I wrote so if I got conclusion and could not answer the question so then I realized that I had not done a fair job of writing my paper my opinion has to mean something. There has to be a reason why this matters. And with moralist criticism, if you say, and the moral of the story is don't eat bear's porridge, I'm just going to write so? Question mark at the end. Yeah, you'll, be, hmm? you'll, you'll, get them a B. you'll be lucky if you you'll get a B. Get a B. Oh. Because your significance is going to count for 25% of your total paper grade. Hmm. Now, how can you build significance? How can you answer that so? Why does it matter? Why does anything matter? Why it to real life? Yeah. Well, that's one way. You can apply it to real life. You can explain how this issue that you've identified has gone on and is still present in current <coughs> life. Maybe you've traced the roots of something. Why else does anything matter? It doesn't. That's not true. Things do matter. <laughs> We're not to nihilism yet. That's next semester. Maybe the particular style, like, has been known. Oh, Well, when you see, like, an article from IFL Science on Facebook, right? I mean, the, or Twitter or whatever. And it's an interesting article that people have shared. Why is it interesting? Why are they sharing it? Why do they like it? Why is it significant? It's cool. Yeah. Why is it cool? What are you saying, Michael? Sometimes, yeah. Uh, and that's part of what significance is. If you can relate to it, if you can show someone how something from the medieval period is directly connected to their lives now, that can help. But let's say the latest thing that I saw that was an IFL science link that was going around was that they had found a, 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 pres a preserved dinosaur fossil that had like some skin tissue intact. They so they could, not for cloning, but so they could see exactly what the reptile skin looks like in the actual color of this animal. So they'd done a rendering of this dinosaur that was as close to a true rendering of this dinosaur we'd ever had. 
why is that cool and interesting and something that's shareable on the internet? Why does that matter to me? No one else really knows about? We can't relate to it. Dinosaurs. We don't need to relate to it. We can't relate to it, that's true. But it, it gives us insight that we haven't had before. Yes, it gives us insight that we haven't had before. It's a new thing about dinosaurs. I'm not going to share a link on the internet and say, oh, look, they found some more dinosaur bones in China. China's full of dinosaur bones. They find them all the time. This particular pile of dinosaur bones was special because they found the skin on it. So perhaps your significance is you have found a new way of looking at this story that other people aren't thinking about. That maybe you have come up with a theory that kind of turns the story on its side. That's also significance. So those are two hard and fast ways to get significance for your theory. One, explain how it relates to us today. Maybe you're tracing something that has its roots in the medieval period that still affects us now. Like if you were going to do a paper about, you know, the evolution of masculinity, for example, that's always going to be relevant. That's always going to be significant because that's an issue that we struggle with now. Um, or if you think of something new that's not something that we've always thought of. Like, for example, when I told you about the night, when we were reading the general prologue of the night, and I was like, look, I think this night is full of it. I think he's making this up. I think he's a boaster. I think these are the reasons why. Not one of you questioned me. Not one of you. And, but you didn't know. Yeah, but you didn't know that that's not the typical response. Other people who went off to read the spark notes after we read the general prologue about the night said, Miss Firth, that's not what Sparknotes said about the night. Sparknotes said he was awesome. That is a common thought. The guy who translated the Canterbury Tales in your book, Neville Coghill, thinks the night is just wonderful and Chaucer's example of, you know, the noble man. I think it's a joke. I think he's putting down the night. That is my interpretation that is different, unusual. That makes that interpretation significant. Yes. So basically, if you can back up like what your thoughts are, there's no right or wrong answer. Absolutely. No right or wrong, like, observation. You can provide textual support. And I provided textual support for my theory about the knight that's atypical to the theory that most people have about him. All right, tomorrow we're going to start working on theories about other stories in our groups to uh, get toward the papers. And I'll give you specific topics and perimeters for that later. All right. Thank you.